Hello, this is Will Faber, and today we're taking looking at a submission by Linda of her 19-year-old ex-jumper, Rajitsa. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. But I have to say what a beautiful horse this is. And uh, you can see, you know, even through the fact that this horse is very um, overweight at the moment, you can see how its back is completely dropped. But what a lovely horse he looks like he would have been in his time. Uh, now, the good news here is I'm not seeing any problem at all with this horse other than the fact that he just needs to develop correctly. So what you're seeing here is a perfect example. I mean, you seem like a very um, well-meaning person. I'm sure have done the best that you knew how to do with your horses uh, up until now. But happily now you know a little bit more about them. But what you see here is the perfect example of what happens to horses when they're not correctly maintained over their back. Even what, like this horse, who must have been a very beautiful and capable athletic animal, his confirmation looks quite good and uh, looks like he has a great mind. But this is what happens when you don't maintain them over their backs correctly, is that even the best of them, they just start slowly falling apart. Now this one actually made it to quite old uh, before it completely fell apart, which is probably a testimony to, you know, you're caring about the horse enough to do what you knew how to do. But now that you know how to do now, you can just imagine there's no reason for this horse to have ever gotten into this kind of condition or to have ever stopped working at this point, you know, because that's what happens. The back just slowly starts dropping and even if you're doing everything else correctly, if you don't understand maintaining a horse's back and what it takes to do that and how it works, they're just every horse you have will just slowly uh, turn into what you have here is, is a horse that's kind of falling apart long before its time. So anyway, you're doing a great job with him. I don't see any reason with this horse, um, as you said, about hawk injections or any of these kind of things. I, I don't inject any horses, period. What you have to understand about injections is they are not a cure. Um, a lot of veterinarians have tried to make people think that somehow these injections are a cure. They are not at all. It's nothing but painkiller and inflammation reducer shot directly into the joints. And every time you do that, um, you're looking to, you can only do it so many times before the joints are completely destroyed. If a horse needs injections in its joints, it needs to rest. It doesn't need an injection and then to keep working. So this is why all these horses that get injected, eventually it doesn't stop the horse from going lame eventually and you can only get away with it a few times. So um, what I'm seeing here with this horse, a lot of people, once again, the first thing that a, a, most veterinarians would do if they saw this, this horse is go, oh, well the horse is sore in its hocks. It's sore in its hocks because its back is dropped so the hops, hocks can't work correctly. This horse is actually moving its hocks quite well. This wouldn't worry me at all. And uh, you know what I'm seeing here, you should be able to bring this horse back with no trouble whatsoever if you're just willing to take the time to rehabilitate his back. Once again, you've got to take the time to get that back strengthened and back up. But the good news is um, it doesn't matter how old they are. I've taken the oldest one I have taken is 27 years old who started with me with a completely sway back. And in a year and a half, I was able to bring them back up flat again. So. You know, you're, you're not stuck with what you've got, and that's sort of been the mentality of so many horse people is, uh, oh, well, this is it. He's done now because, unfortunately, so many of the people in charge, like veterinarians, simply don't know. You know, veterinarians should be the first people getting the education that you people are getting here so they actually understand what actually happens to horses and what really causes um, what happens to them to happen. That is the lack of the maintenance over the back. In other words, the back lack of core strength, just like in human beings. But so what I'm seeing here is just an absolutely lovely older horse who should have many, many more years on it. I'm sure if you're willing to take, you know, from the looks of him now, it will take you one or two years to completely rehabilitate this horse, taking your time slowly the way you're doing here until you see that back. You can see how this horse, because it was never stretched correctly as a younger horse, its withers isn't really even where it's supposed to be, but you'll see that will happen now. That is, the withers should pull up much higher through the, through, through the shoulders and flatten right there at the base of the withers, you'd see that dip that you see there now come up and flatten out as the withers comes up and pulls more forward from the stretching. So the good news is it doesn't matter how old they are, if you do this work and they're sound enough to work at all, most of them will come back quite well and uh, what is wrong with them will heal up, which will never happen from give, giving any horse injections. I mean, it, you know, it's not bad to give them a, like a liquid joint supplement or something like that. Uh, to help them out, you know, something that's going to help just lubricate them. But uh, I'm not really sure. I, you know, I trained many, many horses before any of that stuff was around. I know everybody thinks it's popular these days, but I think if you work them correctly, none of that would actually be necessary if they have a good diet. But this is really good. He's showing a really good rhythm here. And as far as, you know, what I'm seeing here, you know, once again, the same thing with the front legs. You know, the horse's front legs got sore because when a horse jumps and it's not over its back, 
it lands with about 100 times more pressure on its front legs than it does if it is over its back. So that's why all these jumpers go lame in front, because if they're not over their back, they're constantly landing you know, as, like a diver where they're landing straight down onto their, onto their hoofs and putting immense amounts of pressure in, those, uh, in, the, in the fetlock joints, uh, which would be unnecessary if the horse is jumping over its back. They don't land so steeply and they get the hind legs back on the ground faster, which is why we want to jump horses over their backs because, once again, just like the riding, it takes up the concussion um, of riding when the horse's back is up and we feel the horse able to absorb the concussion of movement into, the, into its soft tissue like a person running with their knees bent. Well, the same thing as jumping. It's going to make the same thing. If you jump with your legs straight and come down with your legs straight, you're going to hurt your joints. Well, that's what you're doing to horses that are not jumping over their back. But once you understand that, you see how easy it is. I mean, how much money people would save on veterinary bills, you know? Um, I go to so many barns today that you go into and half the horses are lame on any given day because they don't know how to work them, so they're constantly getting, you know, pulled tendons and, or whatever the case may be but all for the same reason, they're not being worked over the backs. So we can see here, you know, this horse is a little reluctant. You see a little bit of a swishing of a tail. They're like, oh, they don't really want to go this far. But that's very normal. And once again, this horse is not only, you know, has the back dropped. It was very out of shape now at this point. You can see how the belly just drops down. So the horse doesn't really have any core strength yet. So it's, you know, it's kind of like uh, we have to think about, you know, once again, we're our horse's personal trainers. So... You know, this horse, you know, if it's 20 years old almost, that's the equivalent of a 60-year-old human being. So imagine a 60-year-old person, you know, this horse, think of it this way. It's kind of like uh, one, of, one of the ladies who teaches, uh, who taught aerobic uh, dance and aerobic jazzercise and these kind of things, you know, back in the 80s when all that was popular, until they realized that everyone was ruining their joints by doing that stuff. Um, I know a lot of people who taught that kind of stuff, jazzercise and things like that, that have had hip replacements recently and that sort of thing because they just tore up their joints because they weren't moving correctly. They were, do they were exercising, yes, but in a way that was tearing them down. So, and once again, same thing as a horse. It's not over its back. Every step you take is basically you know, sending it in the direction of a sway back and, and, uh, and kissing spine and all the rest of it. But the good news, all of those things are simply cured by what you're doing. So... You know, uh, and you think about over your life how many vet bills you probably paid uh, somewhere along the way if you were working the horses to, to end them up the way this one was. It would have never been necessary. But as I say, that's why this horse would have gone sore in front and why all jumpers go sore in front because they're not landing correctly, so they're taking too much pressure on their front legs. But I'm not seeing anything here with this horse that worries me at all. Um, I, I think he's actually su you know, surprisingly good for you know, what you're telling me he's been through. And when you know, all that walk work was very nice, he's flexing plenty, I mean, there would be no reason for me, you know, once again, just know that it will take a year to two years to completely bring this horse back. But I don't think it's even that bad. I mean, I think you'll see a huge change in this horse in, you know, in six months' time easily. Um, it's nowhere near as bad as some that I see. So you've done a really good job with it, and uh, he should turn back into a horse that you should be able to use for years to come, unless there's something really damaged in there. But I'm certainly not seeing that. You know, you've, you've got to remember when a horse is not working over its back, its stride, for instance, is never going to be level. It's never going to be equal stride on both sides because the horse's back is not up. It can never straighten. So remember, that's what allows a horse to straighten is to be able to lift its back. <clears throat> if it can't, it'll never be straight. And if it's not straight, that is in its body. That is, the spine will have a bend to one side or the other until the, lift, until the horse lifts its back, which is how we get to straighten horses. You know, there's a lot of confusing people out there talking about, they call it straightness training, where... They seem to know nothing about a horse lifting its back, and they seem to spend all the time trying to just line up the front of the horse in front of the back end, which doesn't really work. As soon as you get the horse to lift its back, then the front end will line up in front of the back end. It's as simple as that. That's why if a horse is over its back, it's easy to do square halts because the horse will come up, its back is up underneath you, and the body of the horse is straight. Therefore, the horse will want to step up and stand straight. So while this we see a little bit of hesitancy in the horse's stride here once in a while, but really nothing bad at all. Where you have this horse right now is exactly where you want it to be. He's even starting to show a little bounce there. And once again, notice that as his head goes deeper, rather than being more on the forehand, notice how as the head goes deeper, we see more flexion in the hock and we see the shoulders start to swing. That's because the hind leg is able from that position to begin to push up into the back. Like there is really quite good. So I think you're right on track with this horse. I mean, I wouldn't worry about, you know, you asked me about the riding thing. I, when we get to the riding, it actually looks quite good. And I, I think you can keep doing it at the level that you're doing it.
But, you know, most of you are going to work right now that's going to be beneficial is doing what you're doing here, doing the work in hand and doing the lunging, getting the horse in better shape till you start to see that core begin to develop some strength as he starts to pull up through the abdominal wall. And we see that belly, which it already is starting to go away here, just from doing a little more trot. Really good right there. So that was all very good. I don't see a single problem here whatsoever, and certainly nothing I'd waste any money uh, on veterinarians on. This horse looks just fine. If you just keep doing what you're doing, it should develop right back into a lovely, lovely horse and be even better than it ever was before. So if you go back and read the old books on riding and, and jumpers from the past, you know, before they had all these kind of quick fixes like injections, you know, they always talk about, you know, they would always stop at the first sign of any kind of lameness. They would stop their horses and not keep going and let them rest until they look sound again. Rest is what, you know, unless there's a gaping wound or, a, you know, a torn tendon or something, uh, rest is going to solve most of those problems. Now here we see it gets a little bit slow, so watch how the horse's hind legs start to sort of slow down. All of a sudden we don't see that flexion in the hock so much anymore. But as soon as you get it moving again there, it starts to swing again quite nicely. Now it's also being a lot nicer. The tail has kind of stopped swishing around a bit. The horse has gotten a little more loosened up. And it seems a little happier in what it's trying to do there. So there we go. So at least we've got to get it to there. Then we see the horse beginning to actually be able to pick its hind leg up. Remember, if the back is dropped, the horse literally has a very hard time you know, it's those muscles through the back and abdominal wall that help the hind leg come forward, just like walking yourself. If you engage your core, you'll see how much easier it is to bring your legs forward. Well, the same thing is true of the horse. But what you're getting here is enough. I'd like to see a little more swing. And, of course, I always want to see that little bit more swing. And you do exactly that right there. As soon as I was thinking it, you were starting to send the horse forward. So... You have really good instincts with them. I've really enjoyed watching your videos on the other horses. Just uh, We don't have anybody in Denmark right now. Maybe you should consider joining our associate trainer program. might be something you want to think about because you certainly look like you uh, are developing the right kind of skills that I like to see. If that is any interest for you, by all means, contact me about that. We'd love to have somebody in Denmark, which we don't have at the moment. I was always impressed, uh, now it's been since the 80s since I spent much time in Denmark, but I spent quite a bit of time there buying horses in the 80s, and uh, I was really always impressed with how the Danish riders seemed to be really good all-around riders. They could jump and they had, you know, they had a good enough concept of dressage, at least the ones I saw back then, that they weren't ruining the horse's ability to jump by trying to do phony dressage. So I was very impressed with that when I was in Denmark back in those days. Now once again, that's a long time ago, but... Uh, that's what we want to see. Mr. Oliveira himself used to always say, and he was the Portuguese jumping champion when he was 13 years old on a fake birth certificate. He always used to say that people who are afraid to jump will never really be good dressage riders because they'll always be afraid of a really impulsed horse. Now, by impulsion, he's not talking about nervous energy. He's talking about that uh, physical ability, if you will, which is what real impulsion is, the horse expressing, expressing its physicality and correct development in movement. And that movement is very powerful, like a 50-foot wave. You know, it's easier to surf a 50-foot wave than it is a 10-foot wave until you fall. <laughs> you know, so the same thing is true of horses. When we develop their backs, if we don't develop the mind at the same time, these horses can, you know, uh, once again, wild. one of the reasons riding got so dumbed down is because we had a lot of beginners buying very powerful horses who they couldn't ride, and it would have been a danger for them to ride. So trainers started dumbing them all down so that they don't, you know, send these uh, their students to the moon, if you will. But, you know, that's why it's so important to learn to ride correctly, once again, and develop the horse correctly in its mind, along with developing its body. Because if we don't develop the mind at the same time, now we have a body that's so fit that if something goes wrong, it could literally send you to the moon. So they must come together, the mind and the body. Same thing with people, right? We must develop our minds and our bodies. That old sort of uh, Greek ideal of a human being, that is someone who's developed physically as well as mentally. Well, that's what we want our horses to do as well. 
So good here once you're on. I'm not seeing any problem with this. You can see the horse swishing his tail a little bit with a little bit of objection, but not so much that I would say, you know, once again, a horse that really doesn't want to move will just stop on you. You know, and if you have to kick and pound them to move, then, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. But you know, if the horse is moving relatively as nice as this is, and once again, you see, I was still taking those nice big steps behind, picking the head up and putting them down. Um, I mean, I see, in fact, most horses that come to me look worse than this in terms of how they move behind. So I really don't think you have a big problem here. Just keep doing what you're doing and having the patience. That's the hardest thing for people when they first start riding, you know, and really riding and developing horses is the time. Everybody has forgotten how long it takes. If you go back and read any of the older books on training, you know, like, for instance, the Spanish Riding School, they lunged horses for two years before they ever got on them, you know. They lunged them for a couple of years in just the trot or the year for a full year in the trot before they ever even started the canter. So they had a good trot, so they just start the canter and they have a good canter. That was the ideal you know, unfortunately, most people today have this idea they just have to do something on the horse. But, you know, unfortunately, that it's something, if the horse isn't working over its back, is just destroying the horse in the process. So we stick to what we can do correctly. So, for instance, like going to the trot, if the trot doesn't come around within a few moments, you know, and be able to stay over its back, well, then you need to go back to the walk, to where you can. When you build up enough strength in the walk work, the horse will be able to trot. When you build up enough strength in the trot work, the horse will be able to canter. And once you understand that, it takes all the frustration out of doing this. I mean, we watch so many people ride horses today. If you go to any horse show and just sit and watch the warm-up ring and watch these people battling and fighting with these horses, you know, trying to fight them into something they can go into a show ring with. But the really sad thing for dressage is that we, you know, we let all these beginner riders start riding in the upper levels that has just brought the whole sport down. And the only way that was going to happen was if people started accepting a very dumbed down version of dressage, which is what we, where we are now in the world. You know, if you can afford one of these uh, million dollar movers, if you will, you know, pull them into some kind of frame, uh, people will be impressed and they'll give you ribbons. It's a very sad thing in dressage that we, when we see someone come in on a $100,000 horse that's completely upside down and win the blue ribbon, and here's somebody on a little pony who rides absolutely perfectly and has the horse going over its back and fulfilling all the requirements in dressage, and they come in last place because they're not the fancy horse. Well, this is the mentality that we've got to change in our judging and in our national and international organizations. Our, the horse sports will just continue to... I don't know how much worse it can get than it is right now, but... Uh, <laughs> it will continue to get worse and of course with that will come a disinterest in it at some point you know but this is all really good where it gets into that stretch right there now that's where you want him right there and really i mean if you look at this walk it's really pretty regular right here this is really a nice walk he's swinging and stepping he doesn't have that look uh, i mean the hind legs are coming a little slowly off the ground but nothing like what we see in so many horses Really nice shoulder in there, doing exactly right. So unfortunately, too, talking about the books, you know, unfortunately, there's you. it's really hard to find any of the good books. All the good ones have gone out of print in favor of these vanity books that are being done by so many writers today. Most of them have never been trainers. There's somebody, you know, that you know, bought some made horses or struggled their way through, and, and uh, you know, pretty soon they're, they're writing the vanity book, which is just kind of their story plus usually the typical dressage stuff that's in every book about dressage showing pictures of how they're supposed to bend <laughs> but then we don't see any of that very often now remember also the horse is not over its back it can never bend if you watch most most dressage today you'll see the horses hardly bend at all because they're not their backs aren't up so they can't bend that used to be considered a huge fault yet today we see top horses you know going at the top levels doing just that and being rewarded for it. So what we really need to see all over the world and uh, with our local and international organizations is bringing some sense of reality into the judging. Um, Klaus Bockenhall, when he was our team coach here very briefly, suggested that the only way we're going to improve dressage is getting rid of the ability to pay for only the good, I mean the judges that people consider the ones that give away the high score. So. Nowadays, those are the only judges who get hired because the competitors are picking the judges, which you know is kind of absurd because all the good judges who would tell them correctly, you know, they all know who they are and they won't go to horse shows with those people judging. So that's once again what has brought the whole down thing. So uh, down the whole thing. 
Mr. Bockenhall suggested that the only way this is going to be right is we have a lottery. So you want to put on a horse show, you call your organization. It pulls the name of a judge out of a hat, and nobody knows who that judge is till the day of the horse show. Then the judges would have the courage to say what they all, or at least what I know all the older ones know. I've talked to many of them who have told me the same thing. They know if they give one of the top riders a bad score, they will never work again. We even had that confirmed here by the president uh, of our uh, dressage society at a meeting here who, who told us, oh yes, well, we were talking about the sing, and she says, oh yeah, the last horse show, one of the top riders uh, here in San Diego called her up and said, we won't come if you don't fire the judge. So, oh yeah, we fired the judge. So, so they would come because it's so important to them to have the big star at the show. So you can see how corrupt this all has become. Really nice walk here. Once again, taking big steps. So everything I've seen you do with this horse, as far as I'm concerned, is right on track. So just said, just having the patience now to just wait for it to develop. Just keep doing the same thing you're doing every day, asking for just a little bit more each day. That's My goal is always to make every horse a little bit better every time I work it. Getting just a little bit more out of it, you know, either uh, strength training wise or endurance training wise or just mental relaxation, whatever it is, I try to get it a little, something a little better and really everything because everything comes at, at really the same time. The more you stretch them, the more relaxed and confident they become, uh, the more the body heals itself. So. It's really pretty simple once you can understand this one basic concept, which you have now got really well, which is just how to get a horse actually over its back. Then everything else kind of falls in place. The problem is people read these books or get told by uh, people every day, you know, they, they get told things that this is how it is, you know, and very often in cases today, now that, once again, now that stretching has becoming an idea that people are interested in, in I see a lot of top riders, I just watched a, uh, an exhibition of one of the top riders uh, doing an exhibition of stretching horses, and there was no stretching done whatsoever. All they did was turn loose of the reins for a couple of seconds and let the horse's twisted up neck come a little bit forward, which is better than not doing anything at all, but it certainly was nothing that resembled stretching. Max, I was amazed listening to this person talk about how, oh, we don't allow, our horses are never allowed to make mistakes. It must be perfect every time, every day. It's like, you know, oh God, no, no wonder you just retired your lovely horse. Uh, we can't just grind horses into the ground every day about everything that they do. Nothing, nothing is ever perfect in a day. We're always, you know, trying to get it as best as we can, but not ruin the horse's attitude or its body in the process. As I say, I have a one, two, three strikes, you're out rule when I work horses. If, you know, if I've tried something three times and I didn't get it perfect, I just move on to the next thing. You know, it's never going to be perfect in a day. If you have to try more than three times, you know, it's like we have the same <laughs> the same say, saying in the studio when we record music. You know, if we've hired a musician it takes them more than three takes, then we don't hire them back, <laughs> you know, because that's usually what it takes with somebody who knows what they're doing. Or you simply know that, you know, after three tries it's probably not going to get a whole lot better. I don't believe in the hundred takes in the studio and I don't believe in the hundred takes on a horse either. <laughs> it rarely gets better. Sometimes you just have to give things a rest. The next time you come back, the horse is, you know, if you've not upset the horse in the process, the next time you come back it will be better. And of course if we do this correctly, we have lots and lots of years to make it correct. As opposed to, as I say, these days, these horses seem to last uh, two to four years and they're finished. Most of them only two these days. Amazingly enough, it never ceases to amaze me how quickly people are trading in their horses these days or retiring them. Like you would have done with this one had you not discovered what you now know. But look how this horse is moving right there. So everything you've done with this horse today has been absolutely right on. There isn't anything I would tell you not to do. Like look at that stretch right there. And As soon as you get to that place, look how much the horse picks up its legs and how much more flexion there is in the hocks and how much more freely the shoulder swings. Really good work there. But what, what is going to be interesting for you to see if you keep going with this is uh, it'll take about two years for this to happen, for it to come completely, that when, like with any other horse, to get it to the point that you could actually develop collection. It takes about two years that you can start working on that, that it starts to develop enough strength to be able to think about it, if you will. But look right there. The horse is swinging nicely, starting to push up through its back. 
Absolutely fantastic. What a beautiful horse this is. So what I was saying is what you're going to see, because this horse didn't have this work done to it as a young horse, the withers never really got to where they, they should be. That is, they should be higher than they are now up out of the horse's back. And, and get, it would give, will give the horse a much more uphill stance when you see the horse. You know, we used to know this, and people knew that they could, you know, train their horses, to, to, and they would develop uphill and begin to stand uphill. Now, today they're trying to solve that. You know, they bred horses to look like they've been trained correctly. They're, you know, they come out of the box, if you will, kind of like looking like they're a correctly trained horse because they've got the confirmation so worked out. So people just start riding them, and, uh, you know, and of course the better the confirmation is, the longer it lasts, but it doesn't, nothing ever lasts forever if you're not maintaining it. I mean, just like driving your car. I mean, you can go drive your, buy yourself a new Mercedes-Benz for a couple hundred thousand dollars and don't ever change the oil. And two years later, you'll be buying another car or having the oil, having the engine replaced, but, you know, which, which you can do with a car. But unfortunately, with a horse, we really can't do that. We can't just, you know, pop in a new engine. We have to build the whole car all over again, if you will, which is what you're doing with this one. Really nice there, really nice there when you get that little deeper stretch. So that work was very nice, and just how you make that downwards transition is just how it should be, just nice and quietly, take your time. And uh, everything should be slow and try to stay in the rhythm without any tension at all. That's always our goal, and once we achieve that goal, it makes riding so much more enjoyable. As I see many people today, and I watch them ride, and I just think, which is what I see at most resize horses. Everybody shows. I see everybody looks unhappy. The horses look miserable. And uh, I just think, why would you want to do it? You know, if it's if it's that difficult and uh, that much pain for everybody involved, I don't see the fun in it. But that's when people get obsessed. You know, they care more about winning the ribbon is what they're thinking about, not what what is good for the horse. You know, so it's that thing of what kind of person are you? You know, a real horseman. As Shakespeare said, my kingdom for the horse, you know, if you don't have a horse, you're sunk. As what happened to Richard III, he couldn't, he couldn't ride away. So we want to be, have our horses sound and fit so that we can ride away on them, so to speak. And in days gone past, of course, that would have been uh, an important thing and why every country in the world had schools that studied how best to train horses. But unfortunately, just about the time they, that they actually perfected it was about the time that the world mechanized and all of a sudden they didn't need it anymore. And as I say, after World War II, we lost all the horses and lost most of the great trainers that were in the world, disappeared. Um, or at least in, a vast, in any, any kind of vast numbers, the people were educated enough to be able to develop horses correctly. And that's for all sports, whether it's fox hunting or whatever the case may be. As I said, you know, people who galloped horses and jumped knew way before the dressage people what it was to have a horse over its back because, you know, you, it just, um, if, for instance, if you're galloping horses, the difference is night and day. The difference is speed that you can, that you can clearly see. A horse that's running hollow is never going to run at its optimal speed. The same horse hollow and the same horse over its back, the horse will run 30% faster probably and, of course, not injure itself in the process. So it's all the same. There is no difference between just at one point we used to think, okay, okay now when you get to pre-St. George, that should be the point you think, okay, well, this is horse is going to be a Grand Prix horse or this is horse is going to be a jumper. It wants to go and you know, we want to do that with it, whatever the case may be. So, you know, it, but it, it would have been thought of, at that would have been the jumping off point to decide what the horse is going to be a specialist in once you get it to that point of pre-St. George where the horse is capable of some degree of collection and uh, all the things that go along with that the development of that stage, then you're ready to go, okay, this is the, but a jumper would be trained exactly the same way, only you put fences in front of it at some point. So really great job here. Um, I look forward to seeing your videos, actually. Uh, and, uh, so I'm really glad to see you back here with this one, and I think you've got a nice horse that if you just keep doing what you're doing, he's going to be wonderful. And uh, as I said, I'd love for you to think about maybe our uh, associate trainer program, if you have any interest in that, as we'd love to have somebody like yourself in Denmark helping out the people there to understand this work as well. And actually, we've had quite a few requests. Well, maybe it was you, <laughs> now that I think about it, who was requesting if we had anybody in Denmark. Really nice there. So really great job with this horse. I really look forward to seeing you develop this one back into an athlete again. 
Um, as I said, I don't see anything that would preclude that. I wouldn't have any more veterinary work done. I mean, horses like this, you know, I always uh, massage, and if you have a good chiropractor to help them, uh, is a great thing. But beyond that, I wouldn't think anything else. This is Will Faber from Archer Ride. Great job.